All right. Hey, you know what? I want to I want to just spend a little little moment, just a little moment, uh, bragging on the church that you guys are. Um, this afternoon, I had an opportunity to attend one of our campuses. It was the Westgate campus, which we, we don't do a whole lot of talking about the Westgate campus. But then again, to be fair, we don't do a whole lot of talking on Saturday night about the Sunday morning campus. And Sunday morning, we don't necessarily do a whole lot of talking about Saturday night campus. But it was really interesting. Um, this last week, or actually it was about a week and a half ago, there was a young lady who passed away, uh, Kathy Cordell. And she, uh, she attended the Westgate service. And they had made a decision that they were going to go ahead and have her memorial service there at Westgate. And, uh, and I thought that was a phenomenal idea. What a great thing. And not only that, but they also had the campus pastor who, uh, who, who did the service himself. And, and that was so much fun. But we showed up there, and there was about 40 people that, uh, that had kind of pushed into that little space. And, uh, and it was so cool, all the people hugging necks and crying on each other's shoulders and just, just encouraging one another. And then to be able to sit around and to talk a little bit about Kathy's life. And then uh, to have the campus pastor get up and, 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 and give uh, a word from the word. And that, that was pretty incredible. And then on top of all of that, there were some, there, there were, I think the last two campus pastors were also uh, there. So that was kind of cool because, because not only did you have the campus pastor, but you had the guys who had served as campus pastor over the last seven years who were a part of that. So I just sat there and, and as I watched this happen and I watched ministry happen and I watched necks being hugged and I watched life happening and, and Jesus in the midst of the life, I thought to myself, this is why we do this. This is why we do this. This is the whole reason. I mean, it, it, it really is not about, you know, setting up a camp someplace and then inviting people to come be a part of that camp. In other words, you know, having one spot in one location. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but that's just not what it is that God's called Valley to do. So we have made a decision that we're going to go into the world. We're going to go and we're going to press and we're going to set up these little places that are going to, you know, be communities that are going to change not only lives, but ultimately change the world. And I thought, how incredible, what, what an incredible testimony to be able to see that happen on display. And for me not to be the one, I, I mean, I don't know if you understand that, but I wasn't the guy. I was just, oh yeah, you're, you're the guy that, that sometimes we see on the screen. You, you know, and, and it was so cool to be able to see everybody being ministered to and being loved on. So I just want you to know that that's what you're a part. I know that, you know, we show up here at our service here at, at the five o'clock, or maybe you come at the seven o'clock, or maybe even come at Sunday morning sometimes. And I know that sometimes we forget that there's a, those are those, there are those other pockets of people that are gathering and reaching out and loving and ministering. But you just need to know that you're a part of something bigger than what you see here. And that is so exciting to me. And, and I'm excited about the future and about what God's going to do, uh, especially as we have this opportunity to break out and to start this new service on February 9th. I'm just excited about that. I just encourage you to continue to be praying about that. It's going to be a good time, a good, good 2014. And I, I'm excited to see what God's going to do. So here we are. We're in the midst of this new series that we entitled Epic. And basically what we said was that, you know, to live the epic life, to, to live that, that life that God has called us to live, then the goal or the key is to find your story in the midst of his story, right? To find your story in the midst of his story. And, and what we saw last week is we took a look at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 is that God has created us for, for good works and, and those were good works that he prepared beforehand. In other words, God is already writing the story. He's already doing things. He's already established the way that things are going to ultimately go as far as the, the finish and the, the end there. And if we really want to be a part of what he's doing, which will ultimately make it, it'll give us the greatest amount of satisfaction, then we need to make sure that we find our story in the midst of his story. This week, while I was preparing, I found um, a definition for epic life. It was kind of a strange thing. You know, you're just kind of surfing around, and, and I, I decided to type this in, and there was this definition. So I want to read this to you because I thought it was pretty cool. Epic life, heroic, striving to live far beyond average, to live an elevated life. What we said last week is that there is something in all of us, listen, there is something in all of us that longs to, that wants to do something big, or at least to be a part of something that matters, something that's bigger than ourselves. Isn't that true? And last week I talked about the fact that that's the reason that we love sports. 
Because sports gives us the opportunity to be lazy and yet participate in something that's really cool, right? It gives us the opportunity to shout and scream and yeah, go team. And if our team wins and, you know, today it's just incredible that all these people are really excited and they're really, yay, you know, because the Seahawks pulled it out, they eked it, they made it happen. They're moving on to the next, the, the next level and that's just phenomenal. And I understand that. And it's amazing because so many people today that, that I know, they're walking around with these little smiles on their face. And you get to talking to them and you get to, well, they won. They won. And it's interesting because if you're all in with your team, isn't it true that there's that point in that time where maybe you're, you, tonight you're going to lay your head down and you're, you're just going to, there's going to be a smile that's going to come over your face because you're going to think they did it. They made it to the, to the NFC championship. They did it. I mean, this is so cool. And then there's like this little thing inside of you that says, in your face, right? I mean, come on, right? Because, because we all know somebody who says they couldn't, so they're not going to make it. And yet there's something inside of us that wants to be a part of something big. We want to be remembered. We want to, to, to be a part of something that matters, something that makes a difference in the world. But here's the thing, and this is what we talked about last week. Here, here's, here's the incredible thing. You know, as cool it was, as it would be for Seattle to win the Super Bowl, there's something inside of us that wants even more than our team to win the Super Bowl. There's something inside of us that wants even more than for, for us to scale the highest mountain, right? There's something inside of us that, that, that wants to do more than leave our name on a building. There's something inside of us that wants to do more than just leave a, a beautiful headstone in the dirt. We want to be a part of seeing, righting a wrong, of seeing life change, of seeing the world around us change of seeing things happen differently. And what we talked about last week is that that's something that the, something that stirs inside of you, especially even whenever I talk about it, that thing that you kind of go, yeah, that's who I am. That was placed there by God. God created us in such a way that we long to be a part of something big. He, he, he placed that inside of us. And there's this constant stirring inside of us. It's what Bill Hybels calls the, the um, um, uh, holy discontent, a holy discontent. There's this thing inside of us that even whenever we achieve and, and we have a goal, we say, oh, I made it, I got it. There's something inside that says, yeah, but that's not enough, right? I, I, I haven't quite arrived. I, I haven't quite done what it is that I was made to do. So there's this thing that makes it to where we want to live the epic story that our creator is writing. And you need to understand, that is unique to us. Out of all the creation, that is unique to us. I, I have two dogs at home, right? Two little dachshunds, little yappers. And believe me, that's what they are. That's all they do. They just yap and yap and eat, and, and that's about it. But, but it's interesting. My dogs, they're not sitting around trying to figure out a way that they can change the world. They're not. You know, they're, they're not trying to figure out a way that they can solve the plight of other dachshunds in the world. They're not. They're not trying to figure out how can we be taller? How can we make it to where our bellies don't rub the ground? None of those things matter. As a matter of fact, they just want to be fed and they want to be petted and they want to make sure that they've got a nice safe place to be. And yet they are part of God's creation, but they don't have that inside of them that longs, that, 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 that leans into being a part of something big, being a part of something that makes a difference. That part is completely missing from them. But because it's in us, there are times that you open up the scripture. Isn't this true? There are times that you open up the scripture and you read a passage in the scripture and it just stirs inside of you and you go, yes, that's what I want, right? I mean, this week I, I, was, I was sitting down and I was just reading through the Psalms. And, and as you read through the Psalms, there's those places where David is crying out for God to intervene. And then there's those places where David is saying, God, let me be a part of this. And you say, yes, God, that's my heart's cry. That's my heart ache. That's what I want, Lord. And then as you open up the scripture, you stumble upon that passage that's found in John chapter 10, verse 10. Most of you know it, right? The minute that I said it, you kind of go, oh, I know what he's gonna, where he's going with this. But it's interesting because if you, if you really want to know the context and the backstory of John 10, 10, you got to go back to John 9. 
And there's this place where Jesus does something miraculous and something incredible. And we'll take a look at that a little bit later on in the series. But he does something miraculous and incredible. And the religious leaders, they get a little upset about the whole situation. They, they, they don't buy into the fact that Jesus is who he says he is. And they begin to, to kind of push back on that. And they begin to say some things to the other people that are followers of Jesus. And ultimately, Jesus looks at them and he says, now, now this, isn't, this isn't a dead on quote, but th this is Lance's version. Basically, what he says is that, listen, if you're not careful... You're in danger of leading people away from life. If you're not, and he's talking to the religious leaders. I mean, how crazy is this? This is like the pastors and preachers and teachers of, of, of that day. These are the people that knew the word of God better than anybody else. And Jesus shows up on the scene and he says, if you're not careful, you're going to lead people down the wrong road. And then he says, because life, true life is found in following me. And then listen to this, John chapter 10, verse 10. He says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. You know what Jesus is telling us? And this is so incredible, and this is big. And if you're here today and you're wondering, okay, why is it that I got this longing inside of me to connect with something bigger, to do something bigger, to do something more, but I never do it? All right, come on, come on. Because I, I know most of our lives, and, and most of us, if I were to sit down and I were to have coffee with you, you would say, yes, I so long to do something big for God. But I'm kind of lazy. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it today. I'll do it tomorrow. You know, I'll do that in my 30s. I'll do that in my 40s. You know what? I think I'll do it. Oh, it's too late. Right? Come on. So what Jesus is saying here is he's talking about this because he's talking to the religious leaders and he says, he says, listen, you were in danger of, of leading people down the wrong road, away from life. I am the one who gives life. And then he says, the thief, which he's talking about this adversary, this thing that is against us, the thief comes in only to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief, there is an adversary that all of us have that is longing and that is trying to get us to not do what it is that we, inside of our hearts, really want to do, really lean into. Jesus says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And then he says this, and this is the part that all of us connect with. Even if you've never heard it before, you, you just go, yes. He says this, I have come that they, or you, may have life and have it to the fullest. Right? Come on. Whenever you hear that, Jesus came so that we may have life and have it to the fullest. There is something inside of you that leaps, that says, yes, I want to live life. You know there's something more than what you're doing, right? I mean, you're, you're sitting there, and I know you're, some of you are going, man, I forgot that he was on this series. I really like my couch. Why did I show up today for this? But the fact is, is that you know you weren't made to just consume. You weren't made to just sit on the couch and let your days go by. And Jesus says, I have come to give you life, or to, to, to make it possible for you to have life and life more abundant. So if that's who we are, hear me. If that's who we are, how do we do that? I mean, is there, is, is there a formula you follow? Is, 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 there, is, is there some sort of steps you take? Are there instructions that we can read and say, okay, A, B, C, D, and, and then I'll reach it? Because if it really comes down, and, and, and I know, I know, but we, we live in America, right? We, we live in Western society. And, and the fact is, is that all of us have bought books somewhere down the road that says, if you do these things, and then you, you read the book, and you may have even started to do some of those things, but you're going, ah, it didn't really connect me to the situation. So how do we move outside of where we're at and get to a place to where we begin to do what it is that God wants us to do? How do, let me put it a little bit different. How, how do we please God? How do we get to a place where God smiles at your life? Because I believe, and, and I think you, you would agree with me, that if we could ever get to the place where God smiles at us, we'll be fulfilled. 
There'll be joy at that point, right? I mean, it, it, it may be for only a little bit of a moment and maybe life will take another turn and maybe it'll be hard again and it'll be difficult. But we know that if we're faithful and we do what it is that God's called us to do in that moment, whenever you know that God is smiling, you know I'm doing what it is that he wants me to do. And as much as we want to do what it is that he, wa that we want, that he wants us to do, there's a piece of us there's a piece of us that wants to see him smile. There's a piece of us that wants him to say, man, that's what I'm looking for, right? Because there's a piece in all of us that wants to have some sort of acknowledgement. All of us in the room, we all want to, to, to have somebody notice that we've done something. All of us want to, at least, you know, in our endeavors of doing something, we want to, to, to be noticed that we've done it. And that's built within us as well. That's why as little kids, and we don't do it as much as adults because it just looks silly, but as little kids, daddy, look, daddy, 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 look, 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 daddy, look, 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 right? But even as a 47-year-old, okay, not quite yet tomorrow, but even as a 46-year-old, <laughs> there's a piece of me that wants to say from time to time, look, 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 what, look what I'm doing, look what I'm doing. Because there's a piece in us that wants to be noticed, wants to be seen. Let, let, let's, let's play a little game. I'm gonna see how many Bible scholars we have in the room. I'm, I'm gonna say a statement and I want you to fill it in, okay? I, I'll, I'll stop short and I want you to fill it in. The statement is, well done my. Isn't that amazing? Most of the people in the room got it. And those of you that didn't know what it was that, 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 that followed there, whenever you hear it, well done, my good and faithful servant. There's something that stirs inside of your heart and says, yes, that's what I want to hear. When I breathe my last, I want to hear my God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. God created us that way. Growing up, my dad was not one of those, those, those dads that, you know, he, he just didn't give a lot of compliments. That, that's, just, that, that's just the way he was. He, he was one of those guys, and I, it, it wasn't until I got to like my late 20s that I figured it out. My dad's one of those guys that, that if you told him that he couldn't do it, he would do everything in his power to show you that he could. And because that's who he was, that's the way he treated everybody else, right? Like if I walked in the door and I said, Dad, I think I'm going to go, and he says, ah, oh, you'll never succeed. Because in his mind, he's thinking if I tell him he'll never succeed, he'll buckle down and he'll work hard at it and he'll get it done. And, and the reality is, you know, I, I lived my life and we didn't get a whole lot of attaboys in our house. It's just because that's the way my dad was wired. And, and, and I'm not saying this isn't you know, against my dad. It, it's who my dad was. But two years ago, something amazing happened. As a 45-year-old man, I take my five kids and my wife, and we're down there in Vegas visiting my dad, and we're having a great time. We're about four days into it. And, 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 and my dad's watching all of the interaction between the kids and I and kids and Lisa and just everything, and he's watching life happen in the Cadell, at least the younger Cadell household, right? And he's watching this happen about four days into it. I go into the, into the kitchen to get me something to drink, and my dad walks into the kitchen, and he comes and he stands next to me, which is really weird. And it got awkward for a moment. And he looks at me, and, and I think he might have been shaking. I'm not sure, because I was shaking. I'm thinking, he looks at me with that weird look, and I'm thinking, okay, am I in trouble? Do I need to go to my room right now? I don't even have a room in this house, but am I supposed to go to my room? I don't know what the deal is. And he looks at me, and he says, I'm proud of you. proud of what you've done. I'm proud of who you've become. I'm proud of what you've done with these kids. He had a tear. I had a tear. But it was awesome. Because there's something inside of us that wants to hear. I notice, I see it, and I'm proud of you. It's built in us. Even if there's a piece of you that is just so rebellious and I don't care what anybody else thinks, you would melt if that one person said, I'm proud of you. So if that's the case, 
And, and, and we all long to have that place where we can make God smile. And he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Here's the question, where's that found? I mean, because the interesting thing is that we, we know the statement, but we don't always know where it's found. And I think that if we would put it within the context, we would begin to see what it is that God is looking for. In other words, what are the steps to follow? Maybe it's found in the story he tells. The story is found in Matthew chapter 25. I'm not sure if it's going to be up on the screen. We, we, were, we were scrambling trying to get it there, but if it's not on the screen, then go ahead and turn in your Bibles. Matthew chapter 25. We're going to, we're going to kick this whole thing out in verse 14. But let me, let me give you just a little background on this, because in order to fully understand 25, you got to go back to 24. You see, at the beginning of chapter 24, Jesus and his disciples, they're walking out of the, the temple, the temple in Jerusalem. And, and in my mind, I see them walking out and, and the disciples are kind of feeling good. You know, we're with Jesus, right? We, we, Jesus has done a lot of things. He, he, he's, he's lots of miracles and people really want to be with him. Some people are mad at him. We're scared of those people. But we're, this is pretty cool. It was kind of like we're hanging out with a rock star. And as they're walking, and you've done this too, you're walking along, and in your mind, you, 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 want, you, you want to say something worth something in a conversation, right? You ever been with somebody that is like, at least you would deem them, they're a little bit higher in level than you, right? I don't know what that means, like socially, or I don't know, you know, maybe intellectually, whatever. And you feel like, okay, I got to say something smart, right? So the disciples are walking out of the temple, and I think at this point, they kind of look back at the temple, which was beautiful. I mean, we don't understand, but, but people that talk about it, they say that, that, that the temple in Jerusalem at that time was gorgeous. It was, it was a beautiful specimen to God. And they stop and they look and they say, Jesus, Yeshua, look at the temple. Isn't that beautiful? And Jesus stops and he looks at them and he says, it won't stand the test of time. Now, here again, that, that's Lance's translation. If you're looking at 24, you'd say, well, that's not exactly what he said, but that's okay. He said, it's not going to stand the test of time. For I tell you, at some point, not even one stone will be on top of another when it comes to this temple. And the disciples at this point, they're pretty intrigued because all of us are intrigued. I don't know why we're so intrigued with end times, but we're pretty intrigued with end times. When it comes to something that has to do with the end, oh, we want to know. So the disciples say, whoa, whoa, what? Tell me, how does this happen? When is it going to happen? Because we want to know the dates, right? And Jesus begins to give him all these signs, and he begins to say, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. There's going to be some tribulation, and this is going to take place, and all this stuff. And then ultimately, he gets to a place where he says, no one knows the day or the hour. Not the angels, not even the Son of Man, which is really not very satisfying. Let's just be honest, right? I mean, we want to know that that's been like the biggest question. Books have millions of books, billions of books have been sold just based upon the fact of somebody saying, I got it, figured it out. And Jesus says, no one knows, not the angels, not the son of God. And then he changes the story and he begins to tell some stories. And basically what he does is he says, listen, you guys need to understand we, I, I want to talk about the kingdom now, which is really cool because Jesus, they're, they're so interested in the end times and Jesus says, don't be interested in the end times. I want you to be interested in what to do in the meantime. What do we do now? And then he gets to this story. He says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey. Now the it there is the kingdom of God. So essentially what he's saying, again, the kingdom of God will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents of money. Now, a talent was worth, scholars say, around 20 years of wages. So five talents, that's 100 years of wages. I don't know about you guys, but that's pretty cool. I'd be excited, right? Of course, you'll find out that it's not, it wasn't like his, to his, but anyway, to one, he gave five talents of money to another two talents and to another one. Each he gave according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. 
The man who had received five talents went out at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one who, uh, the one with two talents gained two more. But the one who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of the servants of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who'd received five talents brought the other five. Master, he, told, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew you were a hard man and harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the, ba with the bankers so th that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Now, when Jesus would tell these stories, let's just see if we can kind of make a little bit of sense of this. When Jesus would tell these stories, these, these, these are parables, right? And a parable is, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. In other words, it's things that we can grab hold of, things that we can wrap our minds around, but yet they mean something, something, something else in another realm. And Jesus starts the whole thing out and says, the kingdom of God is like. And he begins to lay this out. So he is saying the kingdom of God is going to be exactly, or not exactly, but it's going to be something like this. And then we have these three things or three characters that are represented. We have the master. And most scholars, and I think everybody in the room, we all get this, right? The master, that represents God. This is God. And, and, then, and then we have the servants. And the servants, well, that represents the followers of God, the followers of Jesus, those who have committed their life to Jesus. Though at this time when Jesus is, 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 is saying it, it doesn't fully make sense for the full followers of Jesus because, well, it just, it wasn't what it is today. And then the, the talent, that's a whole nother thing, right? I mean, that, that doesn't make sense at all because sometimes we get that mixed up. Does that, is he talking specifically about money? And I don't think he's talking specifically about money. As a matter of fact, I, I think it goes a step further and it has to do with gifting it has to do with, 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 with things that God has given you, a, a leaning, a, a desire in your heart to do whatever that is. It could be a talent. You, you could be a phenomenal singer. And that could be something that was given to you from God. So as we take a look at those three things, you got God and the servants and then, and then, and then the gift that God is, is given. There are three things I want you to grab here. The first, and listen, yeah, they're not going to be up on the screen. You have to write them down if you want to hold on to this. But the first thing you need to understand is that it all belongs to the master. Right? Because I think sometimes we get that mixed up. Sometimes we have a phenomenal ability to do certain things. Maybe you have a phenomenal ability to make money. Maybe you have a phenomenal ability to make friends. Maybe you have a phenomenal ability to sing. Whatever it is, you have this thing that's been given to you, and it's incredible. You got this. It, you lean into hospitality, whatever that is, and you kind of feel like it's yours. It's been something that's been given to you, and it's yours. But the reality is, if you take a look at the story here, Jesus says that a certain man or a master entrusted his wealth, entrusted his stuff with somebody else. It belongs to God. It all belongs to God. So what that does immediately, I don't know about for you, but that takes away all bragging rights. So it's not like you can say, ha, 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 I've gotten you don't. How cool is that? But the opposite is true as well. You can't say, I don't and you do, so poor me, right? Because it's God's and God gives. That's what he does. He is in the business of giving. And he gives. And it's not so much about having more or not having as much or anything else because we'll see here, it's not about the gift. It's about the one who gives the gift. 
The second thing that we need to see as we take a look at this is that God gives according to our abilities. Now, let's just stop here for a minute because I don't know about you, but my brain hurts when I think about this because I think that my ability to sing, or lack of ability to sing, my ability to sing is my ability. But that's not what he's saying here. See, see we, we get this mixed up. Ability is your willingness to be faithful with what God has given you. That's what he's talking about here. So God gives the gifts according to what he understands. Will you be faithful with it? Do you see that? According to the abilities, five gifts or five talents, two talents, one talent. That would mean that the person with five talents, according to his ability, I know this person. They have been faithful in the past. I will give them more because they have the ability to do more with this. Now, please hear me. Please, please, please. Because I know in our minds we think, yeah, but I only have the one talent and I get that. But it's not about the gift. It's about what you do with the gift that matters. Trust me on this. It is not about the gift. It's what you do with the gift that really, really matters. You see, sometimes I, I have met, and you know people like this too, they're incredibly gifted people. And you watch them. But they're going nowhere. And ultimately, they will go nowhere. Why? Because they think, I am gifted and I deserve that. Whatever that is. The big, the high, the big stage. And God says, no, whoa, 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 whoa. You're gifted. But it's about developing the gift. It's about developing the ability. It's about developing the, 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 the faithfulness to get there. Please hear me. Please, I know it sounds like we're, we're going off track here, but you, we'll, we'll tie it together at some point. I have known people that had the ability to do great things for God, but because they couldn't or because they, they weren't given the opportunity up at the very top level, they founder, they fall, and they never develop. In the real world, in the, in the, you know, in the secular world, we, we call that raw talent, right? You hear somebody play an instrument or, or, or play sports or something, and you go, wow, they've got raw talent. And you know, if they just get the right coaching, the right teaching, the right whatever, they're going to go far, right? We know that. And I think in a lot of ways, God is sitting here and he says, listen, if you want to please me, then start where you're at with what you have and be faithful with it. That's so much easier than sitting there and saying, I got to get to be a five talent person before I'm blessed. I got to get to the five talent before I finally have God smile at me. It has nothing to do with that. It, it, it has everything to do with what you do with what he gives you. Third point, third point. God expects you to invest what he has given you. He expects you to invest what he has given you in his kingdom. A part of, of God entrusting you to do something is that he, he, he expects you to do what's right with it. And, and the, we see this in the, in the story, right? There's an expectation. Five, he came back with five more. Two, he came back with two more. One, you wicked, lazy slave. There was an expectation. You should have done something. You should have done something. And here's the interesting thing, and I don't know if anybody ever sees this or notices it, but did you notice that the master's really not interested in receiving back what he gave? Do, do you see that? Like they show up and they say, Master, list, you, look, you've given me five, and I bring back five more. He says, that's awesome. Take it all. And I'm going to make you master over more. Master, I've given you, you gave me two. I made two more. Great. Take it all and do more with it. Master, I hit it. You, tore, you horrible, despicable person. Rip it away and give it to somebody else. Because I don't need it. I just want it to be poured into my kingdom. I want it to bring back dividends. I want it to bring back what I want it to, I want something for it. Isn't that cool? 
man, that, for me, it takes so much pressure off of everything. Because in our minds, we think to live the epic life, to, to, to watch God or to have God smile or to have him say, well done, it, it's dependent upon how many great things I do. And I'm telling you, it only depends upon will you be faithful with what he's given you now until he decides to give you more. That's it. I can remember whenever I first felt the calling for God to, 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 to be this, to be a pastor, to, to, to pastor a church. And, and, and I remember you know, going forward, and I remember saying, okay, I, I really think that God's calling me to do this. It's vocational ministry, and I think... And I remember a year later, I think maybe I'd preached one time. And, and listen, you need to understand, and, and you know this about me, I, I'm not really excited about getting up and speaking anyway. That's just not me. I, I don't sit there and go, wow, oh, man, I, you, you know, people are passing me by. I need to be up and preach all the time. I, I don't think I do this that well in reality. But, but that year where I was not being used at all and being passed up a lot, I'd sit there and go, why are they passing me up? What's going on there? And then another year goes by. Why, why do they just got me teaching youth? I can do more than teach youth. I felt like I was being passed by, but the reality was I wasn't being passed by. I was being developed. God was doing something in my heart to help me to become the person that he wants me to become. So here's my question. Here's the thing. We're going to end it here. This is how we're going to kind of bring it to what are you doing with what God has given you. And come on, let's just be honest. Don't, and don't make something up. Because I know sometimes, you know, there's, this, there's those questions. You know, they, like today I had somebody ask me, so what you been up to? I hate those questions. Because, I mean, how do you answer those questions? I haven't seen you in a year. Where do you want me to start? Right? I mean, so I just made something up. I just picked something out of a hat and, ah, oh, this is what's going on. Oh, okay. Just don't do that. Where are you at? What are you doing with what God? It doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum. It doesn't matter if you're a one-talent person or a two-talent person or a five-talent person. It really doesn't. God will be disappointed in the five-talent person if you fail to do it. Where are you at? What are you doing? You want to see him smile? Be faithful with what he's given you. That's it. And he'll increase, and he'll give you more opportunities, and your influence will increase, and he'll trust you with more. You want to live an epic life? Be faithful with what you got right now. It'll amaze you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you. I thank you that your word guides us, directs us, teaches us. <laughs> And God, the truth is, everybody in the room, we, we love talking and dreaming and, 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 and making lists of things that we're going to do next year. <laughs> but the reality is, is that all of us have trouble executing what you want us to do now. Just simply saying yes to the now. God, I pray that you'd help us to get our heads out of the clouds and put our feet on the ground and begin to do what it is you've asked us to do right where we're at so that we could begin to experience you and your power and live that epic life now. For Lord, I ask this in your precious name. Amen. Now, on your connection cards. Everybody has a connection card on their tables. If you'll take that, and if you'd, if you'd put your name on there, that'd be great. If you put something away for me to, to contact you, that would be fantastic as well. But on the back, I think it's the fourth bullet down. It says, I will take what God has given me and use it for his kingdom. If you're saying today, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm going to do that. Would you check that and then put it into the little jar in front of you? And we'll get that. It'll make its way to me. If you have a prayer request, do that. It'll make its way, way, way to me. To you, Lord, I lift my soul. In you, oh God, 
Thanks for being here tonight. Could have been watching the Seahawks game and staying home, but you came here instead. So, go Hawks. We'll see y'all guys next week. <laughs>